episode is brought to you by Redhead Wines. At Redhead Wines, we believe the secret to unlocking the magic of a wine lies first and foremost in the deep involvement of the winemaker with a hands-on approach to every step of the winemaking process. We craft award-winning libations with fruity, spicy, and unique flavor combinations sure to delight any taster. The journey we embark on to discover ourselves, find happiness, and celebrate life can be enjoyed even more once you uncork one of our bottles. To discover more, please visit our website at redheadwine.us. Unleash your spirit of a sassy redhead with Redhead Wines. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Canopy Cast. My name is Christopher McGurn with my two co-hosts, John Michael Price and Michael O'Connor. Today we have a very special guest, Marissa Sergi, founder of Redhead Brands, and she's also the CEO of Redhead Brands. Marissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, really been looking forward to this one for sure, and uh, I'm excited to to learn more about who you are, what you do, and and just kind of have you walk us through that. So, yeah, my uh, my first question for you really is, you know, what got you into the wine business? What where did the inspiration, where did the interest start there? I think the inspiration was just not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. To be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I grew up in a family that had a very heavy Italian background. Uh, My grandparents immigrated here from Italy, bringing over the winemaking tradition, of course, all the delicious homemade recipes. And just growing up, there were a lot of uh, family and friends coming over in and out of the house, enjoying wine with their meals, or even coming over to make wine during harvest, which is in the fall. So it was just something that always gave me warm memories. And I really wanted to be able to take something like that into my career. And I found that Cornell University offered a wine major. So I applied and I was hooked from there. Wow. Now, is that, is that like what got you into, you know, Cornell specifically? Was there something about Cornell, like in particular compared to other schools? It's like, I want to go here for this particular program. Like, is that how that kind of lined up? Absolutely. To be fully transparent, I didn't even know Cornell University was an Ivy League school. I just knew that they were on the East Coast and offered the viticulture and knowledge major. I come from a very small town, so uh, the mentalities really go to the schools and the surrounding area. I didn't really think there was more beyond, uh, you know, the 100 mile radius of my small town called Lowville. Uh, so once I found that Cornell offered that major, I was like, absolutely gotta go. It's time to branch out and spread my wings. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. awesome. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that coming from a small town. Uh, I live and, and grew up about 30 minutes from Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, so Virginia is a huge wine state as well. But uh, the closest college to me was UVA and a lot of people in the area wanted to go to UVA or to Virginia Tech and the site was kind of like within Virginia so I completely understand that like small town uh, you know mindset of kind of wanting to stay close to home uh, yeah definitely. awesome that you that you branched out and went to Cornell it's a great school thank you yeah it's it's funny so the the three of us actually met at university we all went to franciscan university in steubenville and that actually brings me to to my next point i forgot to mention this earlier the way that i first came across you was through two of my friends they they had you on their podcast the next side hustle with john hostel or john paul doherty yeah uh, shout out to them by the way they're wonderful but i remember like they they had you and they they're like dude like look who we got on our podcast and i remember and i was like oh my gosh like that's <laughs> awesome so like i remember when we started doing this our own podcast like that's what inspired me i was like i'm gonna reach out to her and see if she wants to come on this podcast thank so you all world yeah you're welcome of course yeah, networking yeah. works right <laughs> exactly that's how networking happens <laughs> yeah I, I i just remember that and i was like wow what a small world but anyway that's great. Let's see. What else do we have here? So, yeah. So, you know, someone with your age and experience, it's really impressive. I have to say, you know, everything from Forbes under uh, Forbes 30 under 30, a couple different times, right. As a, as a finalist, I know we talked about that. That's awesome. By the way, congratulations. That's very Thank impressive, you. but it, it just seems like you have so much going for you at such a young age. Like, like, I guess, would you mind just kind of explaining that, you know, what that's like, you know, with with the accomplishments that you've already attained and what you're looking to do moving forward and just like at the pace that everything's going, you know, what is that like for you personally? Well, it's 
pretty interesting. I think on the outside looking in, a lot of people might be like, wow, she's so young, or I, I want to achieve that. But it's kind of a double-edged sword, and I'm very happy where I'm at at age 26. But I definitely have sacrificed a lot when it comes to my personal life or um, other things that are intertwined with my personal life. And um, there are many moments where I have to remind myself that I need to live. You can't just work all the time. You need to experience things. You need to take that vacation or you need to take that trip or see that um, whatever museum. Just really put yourself in the moment because I'm so inundated with a lot of my work or the goals that I have that you have to remember that you're on this earth to enjoy yourself and experience and learn things. It's not always about work, but don't get me wrong. I'll always be dedicated. Um, it's my passion and that's why I'm so embedded with it. And I think just if I had to give anyone advice on you know, how to become successful, it's really to find what you're passionate about and what you enjoy working on where it doesn't feel like work, like, oh my goodness, I don't want to do this today. I don't want to wake up and go. Um, every day I'm excited to get up and work on Redhead and the, the winery that um, I now am acquiring called Luva Bella Winery. And uh, it, it's just something that I really encourage people to really look inside themselves and just say, I love this. I'm going to dedicate all my time to learn about it and try to make a career out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that actually reminds me of a couple things I like to say, one of which is I, I work to live, I don't live to work, right? So like there's more to my life than just working. Um, I need to work in order to pay the bills, I need to work to, you know, survive and all of that, but like work is not my motivation and I, and I feel like that's similar to what you're saying as well. And um, yeah, it also, wanted, like it, it prompted me to ask you, when you were at Cornell, was there a lot of times where like your friends would want to party or like hang out and you were like, focusing on career I mean obviously academics and everything but even outside of that like at that time did you already know you wanted to start like redhead and all of that like what was that like like in college with all your friends probably wanting to hang out and you're like focusing on your career well that really wasn't the case at all I really didn't discover redhead until the last year and a half of my time at Cornell and I was really just studying wine I was like any other student struggling to meet deadlines and pass classes, the whole nine yards. I was not a straight A student by any means. Um, actually, I think my first semester fall GPA was a 2.3. Not proud of it, but I just want to share that because like, yeah, I yeah. think people don't realize just because I'm successful doesn't mean I had straight A's and I had perfect whatever you need to expect to be successful in whatever you apply yourself to, but I really uh, didn't do very well in some of my classes, but it's more about um, how you apply yourself in your everyday life, especially when it comes to your career. But um, I definitely went to parties. I definitely enjoyed my college time, but yeah, there were a lot of times where I was too tired to go out, but I really had a great friend group that had that nice balance between let's actually do something versus, oh, let's just have a movie night with wine and uh, hot wings or something so it was definitely <laughs> <good>. <laughs> yeah and like when you when you started with everything like you know like you're saying kind of after college like what was it like with all of your friends was it like pretty supportive like hey like go for it you know and like helping you with whatever you needed was it kind of like oh like okay good luck with that like what, what was that like you know with the the support from friends and family I definitely had a lot of support from my friends and family. I'm very lucky and I know a lot of people didn't necessarily have a strong support system like I did, but don't get me wrong. I had some family members or friends question what I was doing or sure. not necessarily give their full support. Um, but I definitely didn't listen to any of the negative. It was really difficult for me because I really thrive on positive feedback. So sometimes when I get that flack, it's kind of hard and I have to, you know, take a step back and be like, relax, you know, there's, it's not always going to be rainbows and butterflies, um, <laughs> for a lot of things in life, not just wine, but um, it, it was definitely a, a huge supporting group of people, and I'm very lucky. That's awesome. I just want to say thanks for, you know, kind of sharing your, your GPA, you know, because a lot of people <laughs> attach, and I, I know that's funny, but like a lot of people attach their kind of level of success and almost like give them themselves an IQ rating on how they do in school. And if they're not doing well in school, they kind of like beat themselves up and 
it's, you know, it's too true in society that a lot of people attach that to how successful they can be after they graduate. And it's just not true. Uh, you know, something funny I saw, yeah, yeah, I saw Gary V actually shared his report card from high school. I don't know if any of you guys saw that, but it was yep. hilarious. And I was, I did. At it. And I remember like scanning through and I was just, I was like looking for, did he get any A's at all? And I was like, <laughs> oh, he got an A. And I was like, that's like crazy. Like, that's awesome. Like, what did he get an A in? And it was PE. And I just was like, dying laughing <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that was sophomore year he got another a pe <laughs> you know junior year he got another a pe and i was like oh my gosh this is like so funny um but it just shows you that like you can do terribly in school and still be incredibly successful um you know just some people some people just aren't built for it um and and that's completely fine and we need to you know start recognizing that more and more as a society as well but Definitely. you mentioned uh, you mentioned wine and hot wings. I, I saw I think I saw a video on LinkedIn uh, about an interesting story backstory of hot wings. Uh, what what is that? Yeah. So although I started Redhead as my capstone project, just originally as a, a label, can I bring it to market if I made a, a wine that was of quality and something that customers may have wanted at the time. I was just purely doing it as an experiment, but I did get an email about free hot wings from Wings over at Ithaca, which is my favorite wing places um, on campus. And I was like, okay, they're super, they weren't like super expensive, but like for a college student that didn't want to spend a mountain of money, you don't always buy Wings Overs because, you know, they're better quality wings, so you have to pay a little more. But anyway, I went for the free food and ended up having to give a elevator pitch. I couldn't escape because I had a bottle of wine, I had red hair, and of course, a pile of wings on my plate, so I couldn't just abort the mission. I googled wine industry facts and somehow wound up to be my college's student business of the year nominee. And it kind of catapulted the whole redhead thing becoming a business because I did so many other pitch competitions after that experience. We got a lot of positive feedback. I won some funding and I decided to go for it. That's awesome. Yeah. It's I know, crazy, I know we're all true. big fans of hot wings. So, you know, I, yes. I, yeah. many people say that uh, entrepreneurial businesses are built on pizza, but I, I beg to differ. I like the wings. <laughs> Me too. I, I'll prefer wings over pizza any day. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I, and I guess I have a question too, in terms of, you know, once you made those steps and you're getting the funding, you're doing all this stuff, what was it like to be breaking into the viticulture industry? Because, you know, there's so many incumbent players. There's also so many new players across regions. What was that kind of experience? Like, was that really difficult to kind of break in there or was it more of a forgiving atmosphere? What, what was your experience there? Um, I was definitely naive. I thought I could take on the world and I went for it. I didn't think about the competition. I didn't think about all of the um, ninja stepping I would have to do around uh, certain regulations or um, understanding how the network works when it comes to distribution and alcohol laws. I just went full force and any bump in the road, I figured it out and I kept going forward. Looking back, it's kind of crazy that I started in the first place because if I knew what I know today, I think I would have been very intimidated to even start. And I think one of the main reasons why I've become so successful is I ignored and I was nearly ignorant to how difficult creating a wine brand is when there's only maybe 5,000 national SKUs regularly available in the whole country, but over 200,000 new labels are registered by the TTB every year. So the competition is very fierce um, and distribution is very, very difficult. You have to one, get accepted by a distributor just because your wine is being represented does not mean you're gonna be a millionaire. You have to be on them 24 seven. You have to talk to customers and the managers of the stores. It's, it's a multi-layered cake you have to cut through and you have to have patience for it. And luckily now that I, know what I know today I'm able to navigate it very simply and I still want to encourage other people that want to get into food and beverage especially wine to just go for it because a lot of people will not go for it just because it's intimidating um, you may as well just take that chance on yourself and you never know what's going to happen yeah that's fascinating 
That's fascinating. And, it, and I think that's, that's so kind of a classic uh, entrepreneur thing is, you know, you don't necessarily take the time to calculate the risks you, you go for. Right? And I think that's so important. You know, it is an entrepreneur also just in general, be willing to take chances and, and take action on things. I think that's, that's fantastic. Great piece of advice for sure. Yeah. That actually, you know, great piece of advice kind of transitioned into the next question I wanted to ask you. I, I saw that you had the honor and, and privilege to, to meet Gary Vee. And I know Gary Vee has empathy wines, right? So yes. tell me a little bit about that experience. Was there anything he told you, any, any piece of advice, whether it's business stuff, life stuff, specifically wine culture, like what, what was that like? Well, I think the main place that I met Gary was Sky Sprout Summit last year in Columbus. I actually completely randomly ran into him on the streets of Cleveland, I was going to an art museum that my sister was dragging me to at 8 a.m. And as I was crossing the street to get brunch beforehand, Gary was with his father and his young son at the time. And we literally met in the middle of a crosswalk. And I was like rubbing my eyes like, is that Gary Vaynerchuk? What the hell? And it was. And I was. I just quickly introduced myself. I said, hi, it's Marissa Redhead Wine from the podcast you had with Clay Shannon because I was on the podcast with him um, I think in 2017 so I think I quickly had him remember and then I realized I can't have this conversation with him with his child in the middle of the street and said you know it was great meeting you but I want to keep your family in the street we moved on but you know fast forward to me actually meeting him at Sky Sprout we did chat a little bit but it was more interesting to observe the aura around him. And what I mean by that is everywhere he went, a massive group of people were just following him. Um, people were quiet, just listening to every word. And I just admired him because he handles it so well. There are a lot of people that probably could frustrate him with the questions that they ask, but he's very calm. He sincerely leads with empathy. And it takes a lot of strength because with someone like him, he's in high demand. Everyone wants to get in touch with him. Everyone wants to pitch him. He's just a world-class person through and through. He doesn't preach it just online. That's what he lives. And I could be a testament to that. Although I didn't get a lot of time to talk with him, it was still great to be able to say hello and take a picture with him. But, you know, I, I kind of have empathy for Gary because I didn't want to necessarily – talk to him or try to get his attention aggressively because there were so many people there that I just wanted to respect him and just take what I can get organically and maybe I'll have another opportunity to chat with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure he really appreciated that. You know, like, like you mentioned, everyone's calling his name. Everyone's trying to get his attention. And, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, in a very subtle way, like I'm sure that like um, he appreciated that. Yeah, definitely. I, I took the time more to talk to D-Rock. I really love D-Rock. I just um, admire him. I, I follow him on social media and we DM each other sometimes just to see how each other are doing. And I sent him some wine in the past and um, the clothing company that he partnered with Wildhood, they sent me a hoodie. So it was really nice to make that connection in person and get a picture with D-Rock. I think a lot of people on his team are underrated and uh, they're super awesome, just like Gary. Gary has a lot of alike people around him. So I took his t took the time to meet D-Rock and some other people from Empty, like Justin and everyone else. So it was great. That's fantastic. Yeah. I feel like those are the kind of experiences that really, like, inspire you to, you know, to keep improving. And you're like, you know what? Like, it's, like, despite, you know, like, Gary V and, and D-Rock and other people like that, like, they're, you know, they have huge followings. They have tremendous impact. And yet, like, they're still humans. They're human beings, oh, yeah. just like you are. And, it, and it's really cool to encounter that. So I'm sure that was really, really powerful to experience that. Definitely. It's just nice to see people who they, like, people are actually who they are, not just a persona online. It's really refreshing. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. So, you know, something you mentioned that it was really uh, cool to see his team was a lot like him and he kind of attracted a lot of alike people. Um, so I think that's very true for, you know, anyone in life, you know, the people that you surround yourself with are really important because it reflects who you are and who, where you're headed. Um, so 
that's especially important for entrepreneurs because you know the the little time that we do have outside of our business uh, you know we really need to surround ourselves with people that are kind of pushing us to go forward so how was that in college and kind of who who were your rocks when you were kind of you know, founding redhead brands um you know was that family was it friends um did you turn to anybody like friends uh for advice mentors um you know what what advice can you give to people for for finding those uh specific rocks especially that you had and that were kind of able there to to help you be able to do it it definitely takes a lot of effort to find your tribe at least it did for me um, for a long time in my life, I was not confident at all. I was very afraid to initiate conversations and new organic friendships or connections. It's take, it took me probably until my junior to end of senior year to find my true confidence in who I am today. And I really wish that I had a little more self-esteem and ambition to put myself out there because I feel like I would have made even more of my time at school I was I probably gave energy that I was closed off or not friendly just because I was shy and just so so nervous like I was in a sorority and I I feel like my low self-confidence kind of radiated to um, really distance myself from a lot of people and I, and I and I look back and I realize that and I think that's a really good thing but um, after I started finding who I was and realizing just to be yourself and uh, not overthink things. I really found some great friends and a great team that helped me build Redhead while I was on campus. Like one of my uh, friends from the sorority, Ellie, she helped me write my business plan. And I know for a fact without her helping me, I would not be where I am today because I learned a lot about business from her. So I think just being able to find that confidence in yourself to put yourself out there, network and find new friendships is how you're going to harbor finding that group of people that you're going to be with the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you balance, you know, kind of the, the personal tribe with the, the business tribe, you know, like how do you balance people, the people you're hiring, you know, the people that you're bringing on to your, your team, like, like Gary is. Such a great question because it's something I've been thinking about a lot the last three weeks. Um, I'm in the process of acquiring my parents' business. Um, hopefully we close today. We might be closing during this podcast. I have wow. no idea how close to get a check. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. <Wow. laughs> oh, I'm not holding my breath. It's just been a back and forth battle. But um, it, it really is difficult because I want to be in charge. I want to help find the right people. But I feel like it, it's so difficult because I, I know a lot of people. I have a lot of connections. I'm very out there with you know, being in the community that I have remained a step below the process where I don't want, like I've stepped aside. I have a team of people that I trust at the company to hire because I want everyone to have an equal opportunity to work here. And I feel like just because I might know someone, I might give them an extra edge. So I'm like, okay, so-and-so that applied. I know we know each other. I know you're a great fit for the company, but I'm no longer involved in hiring because I just, I won't be able to sleep at night knowing that I wasn't fair to everybody. Everyone deserves a chance. It's very difficult to find a job that you love and thrive in the position. And I don't want to be a stopping block to someone finding that. So I know that might sound like weak, like I, I should be the boss and I am, but when it comes to hiring, yeah, I'll read resumes and I'll give an opinion, but I won't have final say because I don't think it's fair. There's a lot of unfairness out in the world and I don't want to be just another statistic to add to that pile. Yeah, that's not weak at all. It's wise. It's, 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 very, it's a very intelligent approach to it. And I know like for the three of us owning businesses as well, like we, we understand that. We're, we're there with you on that. Um, there there needs you. to be a fine line between you know, what's professional and friends and where's the balance. And it's, it's, a, it's a delicate line to walk. And it's, it's a challenge that comes with that. So I think your approach to that, your, your answer to that is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been burned a few times by hiring friends when I was really young. And it's just like, I got to stay out of it from both standpoints, being fair and also not ruining current friendships. Yeah. Yeah, I think that shows strength rather than weakness. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're you're awesome. Awesome. It's, no, it really, it does. Being yeah. able to, to divide, you know, the business and the personal is, is it's yeah. tough. Yeah, I have to agree with that, Mike. It's, it's really imperative too, you know, that once you get to a certain point as well, like you just don't have the time um and like if if you're still trying to to micromanage all of that i think you know like mike said that shows more strength than weakness and something that um you know my granddad always told me and you know i learned a lot from him he was kind of my mentor growing up in the business is that you you don't need to be involved in everything if you trust the people that are doing it and he said you exactly. know find someone find someone who's good at the job hire them for it and then just let them do it and, yep. you know, I think that shows a lot of strength as well. And, you know, not just you, but also in your choices. And that if you find someone to do something and you say, here, like, I'm giving you ownership of this, uh, it really shows strength in your decision making and your authority too. And that like, you know, I, I trust you to make the right decisions and, and, you know, I want you to handle this and, and it's yours now. And, you know, I can give you my input when you need it, but, but other than that, like, you know, go for it. And so, yeah, I think that shows a lot of strength. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I definitely agree with a lot of the points that you said. It's, you got to trust people. If you don't trust someone, why are you hiring them in the first place? You have to start a relationship with trust. It's super important. Yeah, it reminds me of two things. One is trust the process. And two is surround yourself with people better than you. And if you do those two things, I'm like, your business is, is probably going to do pretty well, right? So obviously Seriously, there's always... Agree, yeah. 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 And it's like, there's always challenges. There's always going to be obstacles, which again, that's actually the next thing I wanted to ask you about is what are some of those biggest obstacles that you've had to, to overcome that you've had to face, uh, you know, Ooh. over your experience. But, you know, I, I think really like the best thing you can do is yeah, trust the process and surround yourself with people that know more than you that are better than you. Um, and, and really, you know, focusing on that and using that to your advantage. Um, but yeah, like, I guess, the next thing I'd love to know is, is what are some of those obstacles that you have faced in the past? And now, obviously, with COVID, I'm sure uh, people, you know, I'm sure that's on your mind with like, oh, my gosh, what do we do? Uh, how do we adapt to this? Like, what are some of the obstacles that you have been facing that you're currently facing? Well, right now, of course, with the whole virus situation, it's been quite difficult. So I'm really passionate about going into the stores and checking on my customers and making sure they're serviced well. And of course, working with my distributors. but um, my sales representatives, as well as myself, we haven't been in the stores just to be mindful of uh, contact and of course, keeping each other safe. But, um, really other challenges I've had was really just learning, learning the whole industry. You have to start somewhere and not get discouraged by not knowing all the answers. You have to be patient. You have to reach out to people. You have to network and you must show up. Um, you're not just going to step into an industry and have all the knowledge automatically uploaded to your brain. It's just not how the world works. And that patience with yourself and the industry and knowing that the process takes years it is super important because um, if you're not patient, you could be very discouraged. Like for me, I've been working with a retailer for the last three years and it's been a slow clap you get in a few stores super successful but they're not sure if you could be more than a regional brand or can you be national there's a lot of questions that you have to prove um, in many scenarios and although you know you can be something national or beyond what they are preconceived to judge you for whatever experiences they've had before you you just have to know I'm gonna do everything I can to prove them wrong. And once you're able to do that, then you're going to achieve the goals that you have, but you have to do it in due time. You have to meet people halfway. You have to build that trust and it's all about patience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that, that reminds me too, I, I believe it was, it was you where I, I was looking at your social media content and you just, I think recently put a post out, right. Where it was like, I don't lose, I win or I learn. Is that right? Yep. Love yep, that. It's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I love that. I don't, I don't lose, I win or I learn. I might have to use that sometime. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an avid, I'm an avid believer of learning new things every day. You never stop learning and learning is the key to success. Um, and that takes humility. And I, I really believe that. I know I can speak for the other guys. We've all been there. There's been plenty of learning experiences uh, with the business and, and just in life in general. So I, I love that you said that. I think that's 
simply brilliant. I, I really Thank do. You. Yeah. I totally found it on a quote website, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but it, <laughs> it really spoke to me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm totally going to use it for my caption because that's how I was feeling. And I just felt yeah. like it was you know, a mm. good piece of inspiration. Mm. Well, it worked. So <laughs> Thanks. That's yeah, awesome. so that's great. Uh, going along the same lines, you know, of hurdles and, and stuff that you've had to overcome, you know, wine is such a unique product in the sense that it's one of those things where people kind of have a favorite and they they turn back to their favorite you know you go to the store and there's the whole especially if it's you know a grocery store if you're not going to a specific wine distributor um, but you go in the grocery store and they have the whole wall or aisle of, of wine available and you kind of have that favorite in mind you're like oh do they have it in stock and it for a lot of people it's really when they don't have your your favorite available that you start looking at other brands or, you know, a lot of people would just walk out. So, um, you know, what kind of have you experienced in that area of marketing and just kind of overcoming that for, for people having those favorites and kind of like changing their mind or saying, you know, give, give my brain a chance. Um, wine, just like cereal is a commodity. You're going to buy Cheerios over and over again and not want to switch unless you're tired of it. You still love Cheerios, but you want to try something new. And I found that it's the same thing with wine. You might love a certain type of red, but you might want to try something different. You have friends coming over. You want to have a little more fun and experience something together. So that's a really great opportunity to try a new wine, like Redhead Red Blend or Redhead Rosé or some other wines that we make at Louisville, like Purple Rain Concord. And I know we've been able to get a lot of people to try us during that decision making process just from the marketing the packaging and just word to mouth i think the biggest thing that could help any brand you could spend thousands of dollars on marketing but if you don't have friends telling their friends and family that they like something it's not going to go anywhere i i found that the brands that we see the most success with we spend the least amount of marketing on. It's seriously just the pure demand. And that's when you know you really have something. You don't need to spend um, hours creating the perfect campaign or Instagram caption. It's gonna work or it's not. And unfortunately, I've seen companies, global conglomerates, spend thousands of dollars trying to launch a new product with all the correct IRI data and whatever else, and it flops. But I've put things together just by feeling things uh, that are right and just getting that feedback from customers. And it does really well. It's just an unfortunate part of the game. Even with all the experts and research, sometimes things don't work out, but that's why you need to trust your gut and uh, really go for it if it feels right. Yeah, peer-to-peer -peer marketing is definitely the most effective. And something that I, I love having discussion with people on is the kind of effect that happens when someone recommends something to you and it's really interesting because you can see an advertisement you can see someone using something um, you know a lot of tv shows and, and movies specifically use association marketing where like really successful people will be driving a car and all of a sudden you associate that car with success but it's really interesting when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer marketing that if you have a friend that recommends something to you you're so much more likely to try it or give it a chance than if you just see it somewhere. And it's, it's crazy because then that person, you know, recommends it to three more people. And then it's just this cascading effect. That's it's crazy. And it's, it's really interesting how the energy of someone coming up to you saying, this is awesome. You have to check it out really, you know, creates this ripple effect in, in society and it makes things explode. It's, I, I just find it fascinating. So me too. I, I definitely agree. It's um, something that will forever run businesses till the end of time. Yeah. And, and it's so, it's so interesting, you know, going back to the idea of, you know, getting to meet Gary V and DRock, they're all human beings. It's like all marketing and everything you're selling to human beings who have thoughts and feelings and wants and friends and these, this whole myriad of interactions, I think can often get kind of, missed when it comes down to you know straight up market research the data the the polls and everything you can miss that kind of important aspect of it so you're selling to human beings like what are their experience going to be like i was i was a <laughs> this is the one that both of them got me on apple i was an android user 
for my whole <laughs> life until like, very recently. <laughs> um, and and they they convinced me to start using Mac. Wow, this is great. And then they just kept wearing down on me with recommendations. And eventually, I I'm like now the most loud loudspeaker Apple guy. Like <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> I'm more of an Apple fan than either of them are. And it was just because of their recommendations. Okay, okay. okay. Don't don't go that far. I don't know about that. <laughs> Yeah, that was crazy to watch though, because I was just like, Mike, you, you gotta like you trust me, like you gotta try Mac and and whatever. And and she was like, No, 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 PC and Android. And he had his Android ended up crashing. And I had an old MacBook Air and I gave it to him. And he so reluctantly was like, Fine, I guess I'm using a Mac now. And then I think it was within like three or four months, you had an iPad, uh, the the watch and the, the AirPods. It was crazy. That's so funny. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but hey, it works. Sometimes yeah. it's the right thing. You just got to love it and accept it. <laughs> yeah, and, and Apple's not a sponsor. Disclaimer for of the episode. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, I think in that same way, you know, I feel, I feel like there's probably plenty of stories of someone tries one, one of your wines, like, wow, this is great. I'm going to try the whole range. I'm going to start becoming a loyal customer and then recommending that. And that exactly what you're saying like that's so effective especially i think especially for consumer products like food and beverage you know people are recommending flavors experiences it's so powerful yeah we wouldn't be where we are without people recommending us so i'm definitely grateful for everyone that's done that yeah uh, yeah and it's it's funny so like right before you know getting on on this podcast i was talking to my mom we have red wine with dinner every night kind of thing right and she she has her go-to she she has like her one or two that she always goes with and i'm like mom like we need to go, we need to go to the store and we need to look for redhead. We, we're going to try. Yes. So we're, know. yeah. And I'm going to let you know, I, I'll take pictures. I'll send it to you. I'll tag you on social media, all of that. But, but what I, you know, wanted to ask you too. correct me if I'm wrong, but you have an agreement with Walmart. Is that correct? Like redhead, like where, where can people get redhead? I guess that's my next question for you. Sure. So, um, I sell in most retail chains and mom and pop places in Ohio a handful of stores in PA and a handful of stores in West Virginia. Uh, we are expanding um, daily. We're trying to expand to other store, um, not other stores, other states. I'm in conversations with a distributor in Virginia, Tennessee, as well as Kentucky. So um, hopefully in the next couple months we'll be in those states as well. Uh, really just contact me on Redhead social media to um, find where it's at. It's really uh readily available it's just finding a, a location so it's easy to find yeah and we'll put the links to, to redhead in the show notes as well so people can find it perfect yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm currently in Ohio I'm born and raised in Ohio I'm, I'm from Steubenville actually where John and John Paul are from and uh, and I know I'm currently with my parents due to COVID but I was living in Columbus Ohio so that's funny when you mentioned Columbus and then Mike is actually in Cleveland. So you, you hit Columbus yeah. and Cleveland. It's like, well, that's funny. And then John Mike was from Virginia. So you, you hit yeah. all three. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can definitely find Redhead at the Steubenville Walmart for sure. Um, Cleveland, we're all over Cleveland. So if you guys need some recommendations, pretty much all the stores up there have it. We just got into Heinen's. I was about, um, to, I was about to ask about Heinen's. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be at Heinen's the next week or so. They're working on finalizing the authorization. So hopefully any day now I'll get the official word that we're all registered and ready to go and I'll hit the store soon. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Awesome. Congratulations. What's, what's the feeling Thank like you. when you when you walk into a store and see your product there? You know, that's gotta be You would think it's exciting, but it's very scary because I'm like, oh, <laughs> did someone not like it? Is it selling? Is it not selling? Um, are people happy? It's just like, oh my gosh, I got to do something. But then I'm like, relax, breathe, and let it happen. So, um, yeah, that's really the true experience. Of course, it's exciting, but it's more like I want to do something that to help it be more successful. So, <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, I have I have a possible uh, confession question coming up here. Have you oh. ever been? Have you ever been in a store? and seen someone kind of like between two lines or, or searching for something and they're looking at your product and you go over and you're like, hey, I've tried that and, and you should check it out. And, and oh, yeah. like slide. <laughs> I have, I, I think I've been in that situation only a couple times where I actually saw mm -hmm. someone touch the product. But um, if someone's looking in the wine aisle and you could tell that they need a recommendation, I am 
first one there. Hey, do you need help? I, I know why. <laughs> and definitely, I, you know, I'm neutral. You like dry? Do you like sweet? Do you like medium? Because if it fits the redhead description, I will send them that way. But if it doesn't, I will recommend something else. I'm not going to be shysty like that. I want the sale to be sincere, not a one-off where it just ends at that purchase and never again. I, I really try to be transparent with my customers. So um, I will take advantage when it's appropriate, but when it's not, I definitely lead them down the right path. So props to you. That says a lot about your character. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I that try says to do well when I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, I know we only have a few minutes left. So guys, do you have, do you have any last questions for Marissa here before we wrap up? Yeah, I'd say just one, just one, Mike, I think my final question is just, you know, in terms of the experience of, you know, developing the brand, you know, kind of being the spokesperson and advocating for it, you know, across the span of time now, what would you say was the most important thing internally for you to kind of get yourself behind your brand and say, I'm bought in on this, like, this is Redhead Wines is what I'm doing, like this, this needs to, this needs to succeed. I think it's transparency with my customers. Um, I think the biggest tool I've used is video and Instagram live and Facebook live that I could really include my customers on what's going on, the good, the bad, um, innovations in the queue, all of that, because if I'm going to be part of something, I want people to feel part of it as well and be able to really see what's going on, not produce perfectly curated content that is, cookie cutter and corporate I just want it to be what it is and as it is and I feel that's been the most important factor for the growth of my brand is just me being open as a person and really trying to showcase what the wines are and how they are going to improve life sweet and spicy moments <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic yeah, speaking of uh, sweet and spicy, I got to ask, what is your favorite wine food pairing combo? Definitely a piece of chocolate cake and my redhead red blend. Such a super simple pairing that is just so indulgent yet enjoyable. It's a great way to relax from a very long day. But I don't do that every day. So once in a while, it's just my special treat um, to really uh, enjoy my own moment and be in that moment. Mm. Awesome. Now I know what to, to pair with it when I try it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I have, I have two. I have two really quick questions. One, another one of those confession moments. Like, do you still get wine from other companies, like, to Ooh. see, like, how they're doing, slash, like, just because you enjoy their product? Definitely. Um, I'll always support other businesses. I just bought a bunch of sangrias recently because I'm working on um, helping develop a new sangria. Probably not under the redhead label, but a different brand. And I want to see what's working, what's not working, and how I could make a better sangria or really play on flavors that I feel that other people will enjoy the most. So that's something I've done recently. And I have a lot of winemaker friends, so I like to purchase wines from their uh, wineries just to see what is going on and what new varietals they're working on and just to really you know, pay it forward. The industry is very warm and welcoming, and it's definitely not um, – know crazy like you might think it is yeah no that's that's great my last question for you is with everything going on obviously with with wine culture and just like what you're trying to accomplish here in your career have you i don't think you mentioned this earlier have you like gone traveling to europe or different places around the world like have you have you been able to do some like stuff like that as well yeah about 12 months ago um, I was in Italy and I spent three weeks there and I took my uh, redhead wine enthusiast following and had everyone experience it with me. I shared all the wines and my favorite dishes on my social media and just explained what the wine tasted like and where I was just so whatever I was experiencing, I could at least share a piece of that to perhaps inspire other people to travel or try different wines or even find them in the market. Um, so that was something that I've never done before in my life. And I'm very eager to go back to Italy um, or other parts of the world that are known for winemaking, like Australia, New Zealand, Spain, South America, even South Africa. Um, but for now, unfortunately, with the whole 
a virus situation, I'm laying low. Last little uh, quick answer. What's, uh, you know, you're going to a big retail store, people are looking for a recommendation. Um, what's the best bang for your buck region that you can, that you recommend right now? Within the wine section, I feel like there are a lot of wonderful rosés. Uh, rosés became really popular in 2016, and I feel like the wave really hasn't died down, and there are a lot of unique rosés being made year over year. Like, even for us, we just released a brand new wine called Vino Borealis, and our other winemaker, Garrett and Ed, he, they, um, made a Chamberson rosé. It's a hybrid and it's absolutely delicious. It tastes like Sauvignon Blanc, but more like a grapefruit explosion and a little bit of watermelon and strawberry. And I've never had something like that before. So I feel like wineries just like ours are creating unique varietal rosés that you might just see as a traditional red. So I think it's a really great way to explore and try something new, especially when we're in quarantine. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, of now, now I think I need to uh, get a new supply of wine. <laughs> so, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank well, you. Marissa Sergi, everyone, thank you, Marissa, so much for taking the time to be with us on on uh, Canopy Cast. We really appreciate it. I know for myself, I, I definitely want to get some more wine, and you know, I hope for all of our listeners and viewers out there, they benefited from this as well. So, thank you so much. It means a lot to have you on here. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversations and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to have me on your show. And I really am happy to help anyone, including yourselves, learn more about wine. My DMs are always open, so um, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Marissa. Yeah. And like we said before, we're, we're, we're going to have all of your social media. Um, so all of our listeners and viewers, make sure to check Marissa out. She has awesome stuff, awesome product. Um, so we're going to be dropping the links and everything for that as well. And for all of our, our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you next episode.